Hey everyone, welcome to Crosswinds Church where we're all about the vision of growing closer to Jesus and going to our worlds. No matter who you are or where you're joining us from, there is a place for you here. If you'd like to attend one of our services, you can go to cwcmv.org forward slash sermons to check out the times, upcoming, as well as previous sermons. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the service. working on our team as far as uh, building the church, huh? <laughs> if you haven't had a chance, take a look at uh, what's been going on. We've been seeing some cool stuff happening, and uh, it's, it's moving right along. 79,000, I'm sorry, take it back, 97,760. 97,760. That's kind of a big number, right? Kind of like to see that on my W-2 at the end of the year. That'd be kind of cool. Maybe some walking around money in my pocket, right? Now, what this actually represents is this is the a number of hours you will work in your lifetime, assuming you work 40 hours per week between the ages of 18 and 65. Now, granted, I know some of you would say, well, I work more than that, so you can just add to that number as it is. That is roughly about a third of your life that you have, are spending in work. Now, for many people, they consider their, their job, their work, sort of a necessary evil, I have to do it because I want to get the stuff that I want to get, and the only way I get it is to do this job. Some people out and out hate their work. You know, those are the people that, you know, TGIF, thank God it's Friday. You know, I can't, I can't wait. Or, or they hate Mondays because that means it's yet another, way, another week of work. On the other extreme, there's people that uh, not only do they enjoy their work, they worship their work. Their, their entire self is defined by the work that they do, so they put too much into it. They, we actually have come up with a phrase that people are actually called workaholics, you know, as a po in, in considering uh, you have alcoholics who are influenced by alcohol in a negative way. Workaholics do the same thing with work. Do you realize with all the negative connotation of work that work was actually originally designed in fact, it originally was a blessing from God. If you go to the first couple of chapters in Genesis, you see that God planted a garden in the east in Eden, and then he put the man in the garden so that he could tend the garden. He gave purpose and meaning uh, to, to uh, Adam through that work that he had provided for him. It was only later, after the fall, that the curse came. And then, you know, he was now tending the garden and doing his work by the sweat of his brow. And there would be thistles and thorns. And probably at that point, Adam was thanking goodness and God that it was Friday. Glenn Martin, in a little essay entitled Beyond the Rat Race, put it this way. He says, I've always wondered what it would be like to be one of those seven dwarfs heading off to work. <laughs> Smiles on their faces, excitement in their step, off to a meaningful day in a diamond mine. <laughs> no wonder they were excited. No wonder only one of them was called grumpy. When was the last time you went off to work in your own diamond mine? Our jobs typically are not that lucrative. We wake up, drag ourselves out of bed, listen to news radio, jump into our cars to, to face traffic. For many people, work is drudgery, a meaningless necessity. With little connection between their workplace and the rest of their lives, their life slogan is TGIF. Even Paul Harvey, the broadcaster, used to say on Fridays, Good morning, America. It's Friday. Is it really possible, he asks, to earn a living and make a life and yet to honestly enjoy your work? 
Well, that's where the Apostle Paul is going today. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Timothy. We're into the last chapter. We're, we're coming to the end here in the next couple of weeks. We're in chapter 6. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. And of course, we've been looking at this throughout the entire summer, how to build the church. And of course, when we talk about building the church, we do have building programs that are going on here at the church, but that's not the kind of building that the Apostle Paul is telling his protege, Timothy. Paul, you'll remember, established this church in the city of Ephesus, and then he went off to do other things and left Timothy uh, in charge, and he wrote this letter to Timothy to give him instructions on how to build the church. And when he says church, he's talking about us. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We, the people. And so this morning, He's going to continue talking about, as he has been over the last few weeks, about this idea of honor and respect for various individuals. Of course, initially, we heard that you need to honor and respect the Lord. To honor somebody is to, to give proper recognition to them, to, to value them. In fact, the word even is, has, has a, a, a financial connotation to it, to, to attach value to something. For the past three weeks, we've seen how we have been, it is necessary in the church to be honoring and respecting everyone, the young, young and the old women, the men, uh, respect the widows, as we saw a couple of weeks ago. Last week, we talked about honoring and respecting the elders in the church. In fact, not just honoring, giving them double honor. And today, we're going to look at masters. And in fact, these masters are to receive all honor and we maybe, well, we probably don't have what we would consider to be masters. I guess it depends on your job. I would prefer to say, let's honor and respect the boss, okay? And I don't mean Bruce Springsteen. All right, <laughs> chapter one, now, verse one says this, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Now, this idea of the yoke of slavery is probably a pretty apt description considering that slaves in that day at times weren't treated much better than cattle. So you know, they would kind of sense that they would have a yoke on them. Uh, they, were, uh, they were property in one sense. It, was, it could be a very difficult life. While at the same time, some slaves were treated extremely well. Otherwise, why would you have the passage in Exodus chapter 21 where uh, it, there's actually a prescription there for becoming what's known as a bond slave, a slave by choice? It, it says if you love your master, you can actually become attached to your master for life. So obviously some slaves had it pretty well. They were educated. They, they could even have been paid something. They were treated quite often as family members. They had positions like management of the households. They, were, they did a lot of teaching. There were even doctors and tradesmen. They had sometimes good working conditions and even laws enacted to protect them as slaves. In the Roman culture at this time, which is what they were in, slavery was a common practice. It was widespread. It, in fact, is estimated that up to 60 million individuals were slaves in the Roman Empire. That's half, roughly half of the population of the empire. And slavery was different than what we think of it now today. It wasn't necessarily a racial thing. It was more of an economic thing. It was the result quite often of war, you know, uh, prisoners of war would become slaves, or poverty. Sometimes all an individual had was their labor, and so they would, they would, they would put themselves into slavery in order to uh, be able to make it in life. Slaves did a lot of the work of the society, the, 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 from all the way from menial tasks to, to rag-breaking labor to some of these other things I mentioned. You, I guess you could say they were like tools, Okay. They were like the machinery or the technology that we have today. Instead of uh, using a computer in the first century, I would use a slave to do that work. One historian put it this way, slavery was a common practice throughout all of ancient history, but no other people in history owned so many slaves and depended on them so much as the Romans. Many Romans had slaves to do their dirty and hard work for them. These slaves were bought and sold in the slave market. Some slaves were soldiers who had been captured in wars, while others were children of slave parents. If they tried to run away, they would be whipped and sometimes burned with iron, sometimes even killed. Slavery was an accepted part of life in ancient Rome, both by the slaves themselves and by society. Well, you can imagine this was going to be a touchy subject in the church. But Paul doesn't shy away any more than we do. Slavery was a reality in that society, and it isn't going to change for, for a long time. But now what we have is a situation where slaves are becoming Christians. 
And so even though they're slaves in terms of their relationship with their masters, Jesus Christ has set them free. So what does Paul instruct these slaves to do? He says to them, consider your master worthy of all honor. In other words, honor that master of yours as you would anyone else. And you got to ask, how could they do that if it was not a good situation, if it it was a, a dark situation? You do that by recognizing that God is in control. You're not a slave by virtue of the fact that men have put you in that position. You're a slave because God has allowed men to put you in that position for his purpose. In John chapter 19, Jesus goes before Pilate, and Pilate is asking him questions, and Jesus isn't answering him. And at one point, Pilate gets frustrated, and in verse 10, he says this, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And now Jesus answers, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Jesus is a great example of how God is in control of some of the worst situations. And one part of being able to endure those situations is to recognize the sovereignty, the, the overall control of God in every situation. In Celebrate Recovery, as in, as in uh, many 12-step programs, they have what they call the serenity prayer, which I just learned this morning from my, my brother Ken, is actually a page long. I always know the short version, I guess. But some of you would know this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's what, they're, that's what Paul's writing to this morning. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Kind of a parallel passage dealing with slavery is in 1 Corinthians 7. Here the apostle Paul says that each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't, do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. So if you can gain your freedom, go ahead and do that. For he who, call, who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freeman. In other words, you're a slave to men, but you're free in Jesus Christ. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. <laughs> Interesting uh, juxtaposition there, right? So you're, you're free in terms of, of society, but you are now a slave of Christ. And it goes to that whole idea that we all have to serve somebody. We all are under the, under, under the authority of someone. Where you were, and, and the reason we are Christ's slave is right here. You were bought with a price, the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Whatever condition you find yourself in, you are there for a purpose. God has called you there. Whether or not you feel free in terms of the society that you're living in, the experiences you're going through, no matter what situation you're in, God has put you there. We have another name for that. We call that place your world. And if you know, uh, as you leave this morning, in between the doors, we have these cards. We call them the Your World cards. And we recognize that God has uniquely placed me and you into the various situations we're in, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces. And so we encourage you, if you take one of these cards and read through it, the instructions on the back, it will instruct you to pray and ask God, who are the particular people that you want me to to target in terms of reaching out? Much like uh, Gretchen has asked for prayer, I just love that, in San Diego. Here she is, a, a missionary, but she wants prayer so that she can reach out to people in San Diego. Why? Because San Diego is currently her world, and that's where she needs to be reaching out. And so you pray and you ask God, who are those folks? And we like to say anywhere from 8 to 15 different individuals. He'll, and trust me, when you pray that prayer, he'll give you names. And then you write them down because it, it makes you intentional then. And you start praying for them. You start praying for opportunities to have an impact in their life. And again, I'll say, get ready because they'll pop up and they'll, you'll get phone calls. I mean, they will show up. And I've heard that dozens of times now over this past year as we have been doing that. You look for opportunities to invite them to church or to other activities. You, you work on your own life. You take some of the classes. You go to men's retreat. You do things like that in order to get yourself prepared to meet the needs of those people like Gretchen is doing in San Diego as she gets her master's degree. That's what God does. He puts us into a place, and some of those places aren't great places. Some of them are dark places, tough places. But guess what? If it's a dark place, that means you get to be the light. Bring the light, I should say, better. 
What would happen, if you think about it, what would happen if Christians left all the difficult places in the world? Where would be the witness? One of the things that has kind of evolved over the years as I've done mission trips, typically with youth groups, is that increasingly I've had an opportunity to sort of become a pastor, maybe a friend or a counselor to uh, various people on various mission fields, particularly at UIM because I'm there every year lately. And, and so I come in and there's individuals that just need to talk. And it, sometimes it's easier to talk to somebody from the outside uh, and they, I guess they feel I have a little bit of wisdom. And so I spend time doing that. And I've done that in other areas. And a, a few years ago, we were in uh, Salt Lake City and uh, ministering at a church and at one point, I had an opportunity to sit down with the pastor, and I said, so how are things going? Is there anything I can pray for you about? And as soon as I said it, he started to tear up. And I thought, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> and I said, so what's going on? And he said, well, it's, it's really hard to minister in an environment like we have here in, in Utah, and particularly in Salt Lake City. We're surrounded by Mormon culture. And, and we, we don't involve ourselves in that. And he said, and that's fine for my wife and I. It's really hard on our children. And he says, and it's interesting you would ask me this today because last night we just had a flare-up with our daughter. He has a daughter, had a daughter, that was uh, in junior high school, going into high school. And um, because of the, the nature, well, the, the, the Mormon church has all kinds of youth activities and, and, and programs and things for the kids to do. Well, of course, they had to tell their daughter well, you can't really be involved in any of those things. And so their daughter kind of had no friends. She finally found one friend that, you know, that they got attached to, which typically girls do anyway. So she had this one girlfriend that she was really attached to. He said, last night we had to tell our daughter because this girl had gotten into witchcraft, of all things. We had to tell her that, well, you can't really spend much time, if any, uh, with her anymore. And he says that our daughter just broke down and, and she, in, in the course of all the things she said, one thing she said, and, and I'm sure many missionaries have heard this, is why do I have to be punished for the job that you're doing? And this pastor looked at me and he said, I, I kind of think the same thing. Why does she have to suffer because I'm here? I could pastor in all kinds of places that would be a lot easier on my kids than, than in Utah. And then almost in the same beat, he said, but... If everybody felt that way, then who would be ministering to people here in this dark place? So it's a tough thing. If half the Roman Empire were slaves, as we've seen, then what, how, how else are we going to reach them? Here's a reason why we should start uh, treating our unbelieving masters this way. He goes on in verse 1. He says, we do this so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken again. We'll have a good reputation with unbelievers so that the name of the Lord won't be slandered and so our teaching won't be slandered. We'll, we'll be seen as non-hypocritical, right? I'd like to think that, that being a Christian would be an advantage or something that employers would look forward to. I don't know that often that that, that is the case these days. But guys, we need to understand for our sake, from what we get out of this, is that everything we do reflects back on the Lord, Especially in our workplaces, especially in our, in our schools or where we volunteer, if we coach the baseball games or go to the PTA meetings. And what kind of attitude should we have? Well, we see it in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Ask yourself, if, would I do this or would I act this way or behave like this? if I were doing it towards Christ. Well, that should be our attitude. Colossians 3.22 says, Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who are merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In other words, in, with, with integrity, not hypocrites. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Did you catch that? It's the Lord Christ that we serve. And I wonder this morning, as you think through that, how does that truth change your job performance or how you even view your job? How does it change that, that volunteer position that you've taken up? How does it change uh, how you behave in school towards your teachers or, or getting your homework done? So that's how we treat the boss. 
if he's an unbeliever. Now Paul's going to turn his attention to another situation that they no doubt had there in that church, and that is, how do you treat masters who are believers? Or as I say here, honor and respect your brother and sister. Now they're in charge. Verse 2. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more. I was thinking about this. Man, this could get pretty confusing for slaves. I mean, you've got a a master, I guess, on the outside, but in the church, they're a brother in Christ. How does that change things? In fact, I'm thinking even beyond that. What if, uh, let's say that a, a slave actually becomes an elder in the church, and now his master is one of the members It just gets kind of confusing, and and I think there must have been some issues because Paul is obviously addressing it here. Maybe they were taking Galatians 3.28 to to an extreme, like it's a passage that says there's no Jew or Greek, no slave, no free, no, no male nor female. Maybe they were extremely applying that, and it was causing issues to their testimony. In other words, what Paul is saying here is don't take advantage of the family relationship that you have. Again, no doubt a problem, and it's a problem we have today. People expect, I think, some, well, I don't think, I know it. They, they, sometimes there are cases where people expect special treatment because, you know, the boss is my dad. He owns the company. Uh, he's my employer, or my mom, or dad, or the teacher, and so I'm going to do well in this class because, you know, they got my back. Or how about your family at home? There's an application for us. How do we treat them? Do we have a tendency to take advantage of them? in terms of the amount of time and attention we give them, because after all, they'll understand. They, they love me, and, and after all, they can't leave, right? They're, they're my family. They're sort of stuck there, so I'm kind of free to abuse them. Now, I, I say that kind of flippantly, but guys, that is a, a rampant belief in our society today, even among those in ministry, even among pastors. It's not an unusual thing for a, a pastor to downright abuse his family because he's serving the Lord. I know that from personal experience because I was that pastor, and I spent way too much time in the early years when it was just Jackie and I. I I praise God for giving me such a long-suffering wife that was able to put up with with a guy that, I I was the guy that worshipped my work, and when it came to ministry, now my work took on a, a whole new significance. Now, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about life and death, and, and people are going to go to hell, and you want me to come home and be with you? I never said it that way, but probably that was what's going through my mind. Fortunately, I've, I've grown through that, but I, I still struggle. You can pray for your pastor on that. But it's one of those things that, that ministry people often struggle with, as well as everybody else. We, we spend so much time at work because our family will... We'll deal with it. You know, they'll be there when I get home. It should not be, particularly in ministry, because as we saw back in chapter 3, if you're going to be a minister in the house of God, you need to be able to manage your own family well. Otherwise, how can you propose to manage the family of God? No doubt you've heard the old adage that you need to put God first, family second, and then the church third. And I guess that could work for some people, but the kind of way I'm wired that kind of a, a, of a matrix works into sort of a performance mentality for me. I mean, I would start scheduling it out. Okay, I give, okay Jackie, I gave you all the time you're, you're, you're required to get in my schedule here. Now it's time to go to the church, you know. And, and I would work things out that way. I think a better way, a better way that works for me is, is a lot simpler to remember. It is this. Put Jesus Christ at the center of your life. Write down Ephesians 5.18. It talks about being filled with the Spirit. When you became a Christian, you were baptized in the Spirit. It's what we're going to picture next week in baptism. But in terms of walking with Christ and in terms of being empowered for service and ministry, that's an ongoing thing. In fact, that, that verse is actually an ongoing action. You could, you could say be being filled, a continuous thing. And guess what happens when you are filled with the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is the result. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are the things that result from that. And so when we do that, then things are going to be in order. Then I am going to spend time in the right places because if I'm filled with the Spirit and the Spirit is controlling me and empowering me, the Spirit will order my time and things will go as they should go. And you say, well, how do we get filled with the Spirit? Well, we, you, you've heard it before. We call it ABC. <laughs> ABC, the A is to admit, 
admit that I am not walking with the Spirit. If my life is out of control, if, if things are out of whack, if I've got attitudes towards people, I mean, you could just go through the fruit of the Spirit and say, you know, I'm the other list. I, I'm not the love, joy, peace list. I'm the one before that. And, and so that means you're not filled with the Spirit. Admit that to the Lord. And then secondly, the B stands for believe. Believe that Jesus Christ can solve that issue, that he wants to fill you, that, that the, he wants to have his Holy Spirit take up residence in your life and control you and empower you for all that he has for you to do. And then finally, C is to do it, to make a choice. Just say simply, Lord Jesus, fill me with your Spirit. And I'll tell you, as your pastor, there's some days, particularly tough days, where I have to do that multiple times because I am very capable and quick to take control away from the Holy Spirit in my life and start doing things my way, right? Because, you know, that's, that's just the way I'm wired. But I, as I recognize that and I say, look, you know, this, this attitude of anger or, or this, this, this uh, anxiety that I'm experiencing right now, this is not of the Spirit. Therefore, he must not be controlling and empowering me right now. I stop. I admit that to the Lord. I believe that he will fill me with his Spirit, and I choose to ask him to do just that. A, B, C. And then, guys, in the power of the Spirit, we act. Jesus said famously on the Sermon on the Mount, if, if uh, someone asks you, whoever, in fact, he said, asks you to go one mile, go with him too. So if that's honor and respect for everyone, how much more for masters, for believing uh, employers, for believing teachers, that it should be even more so? Why? Verse 2 continues, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Isn't it obvious? They're your kin, they're your family, and hopefully they are beloved by you. Also, you know that they're loved by God, and that should be a motivation as well. And finally, it's not enough just to know these things, as James says. We must do them. Verse 2 finishes, teach and preach these principles. Teach this stuff. In other words, make sure other people understand this. Guys, you will meet people every day. If you're, if you're just paying half attention, you will meet people every day that don't know why they're going through what they're going through as Christians. Why is God doing this to me? Why is this? So we, we have ample opportunity to teach this principle. And then it says preach. So you might think, what's the difference? Well, the difference between teachers and preachers is that preachers, we meddle, okay? We urge you to do it. The, the, the purpose of preaching is not just to give you information, it's to hopefully see you transformed by that information, to see your life changed. And so we, need to be, we all need to become preachers in the sense that we want to see people's lives change. We want to see them walk differently by virtue of what we see in his word. Don't just be hearers, be doers. Allow God's word and the, and the impact of his spirit within you to affect your actions. And guys, I am convinced that the more we do this, the more those 97,760 hours will actually become a blessing, no matter what you're going through, rather than the drudgery that they are for many, probably most people who hate Mondays and thank God for Fridays. Tony Campolo, years ago, I went to a conference. Tony was a, a professor and a, and a pastor and an author. And he told a story about a guy uh, who was a postal worker, a letter carrier, he called himself, and he'd been doing it for years and years, 20, 30 years. And Tony tells this story of how this guy says, well, I was, I, I've been a postal worker all this time. And Tony says, well, you must be a pretty good postal worker. And the guy says, well, honestly, uh, I'm a terrible postal worker. <laughs> and he says, well, why is that? And he said, well, because he, now he was the kind of letter carrier that you walked your beat, right? You walked and you put letters in the door slot and, uh, and you walked the streets. And he'd been doing that for 30 years. And he says, the thing is, on my, on my route, there's all these people. Some people are shut in. Some of them are elderly. And so when I would get to their door, I would meet them, and I would have conversations with them. And that became kind of a habit. And then they had snacks for me, and they'd feed me lunch. And, and he says, sometimes I get started early in the morning, and I don't get done until 9, 10 o'clock at night. I'm a terrible letter carrier if you want your mail fast. And he said, but I realized after a while that this is kind of my, my flock. I'm sort of, you know, some of these people don't get out. And so I began to, to share scripture with them and, and share the Bible with them. And, and I've even baptized a couple of them and, and, and done other things in their lives. And he says, it's gotten to the point where I see myself as a postal worker second 
to the ministry that I have in these people's lives. And that's what God is calling us to, to recognize that, yeah, I'm employed and I need to be a good employee and I need to employ these, these characteristics that we've seen in his word today. But at the same time, I need to recognize that my first service is to Christ himself and that my employer hopefully would recognize that the reason I'm such a good employee is because I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a witness to him, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be? Let me give you a couple of takeaways. First off, I think is obvious. Ask yourself these questions. How do I see the situation that I'm in? And I'm sure that there are as many different situations as there are people here in this room. Bad situations, good situations. Is your job just something that you endure until the end of the week? Or are you a missionary? If it's a dark place, can you see yourself as a light in that place? Or a light bringer anyway? The second one is this, what do my actions tell non-believers? Paul challenged us with that this morning. I, I used to ask this question in youth ministry. If Christianity were against the law, would there be enough obvious evidence to convict you? And would people say, well, obviously you're a Christian, you know, you're off to jail now. And so do, do I make sure that God's name and God's teaching are, are pushed forward and not slandered because of my actions, my behavior, my words? And finally, number three, how do I treat my brothers and sisters, those here in this room as well as those in your family? How do I behave towards them? An individual wrote a, a statement a few years ago and decided that he wanted to live a perfect Christian life, at least for one day. And here's what he said. He said, I've spent so many days when I haven't lived the kind of Christian life that I'd like to. So last night when I said my prayers, I asked God to help me live a really Christian life today. It'll be Saturday. So no work to go to, so I can be single-minded in my devotion. He's going to do it for one day really good. So this morning when I woke up, I thought of it again, and even before I got out of bed, the telephone rang. It was my next door neighbor. He'd had a terrible toothache all night, and when he called the dentist this morning, he was told to come right down. He had one problem. His wife was at work, and his little boy, Billy, was in bed with the chicken pox. Of course, I said I'd be right over. I gave Billy his breakfast. I took care of him until his dad came back. Well, there went my morning. But hey, I still have the rest of the day to to live that really Christian life that I want to live. As I was finishing up mowing the lawn, it was about noon, and I was thinking of what I could do in the afternoon that would really be of service to God. And then there was a, a knock at the door, and it was another one of my neighbors. He'd been in and out of a mental hospital the past few years, and, and so he wasn't able to legally drive his car. He needed to get some shoes, and he wondered if I could take him to the store. Well, How could I say no? As we walked through Walmart, he also realized he needed shirts and jeans as well as shoes. Afterwards, uh, he was kind of thirsty, so I treated him to a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And there went my afternoon. It was supper time before I had a chance to think of my decision again. Remember, Remember what that was? I wanted to live today the kind of a Christian life that I always want to live. So as I peeled the potatoes that my wife had left for me, I tried to think of some big, important thing that I could do in the evening that would really be serving God. But before I could think of anything, my wife comes in the back door and she says, Honey, I hope it's okay. Uh, We're having company this evening. I I met a couple, Bob and Carol, who just moved into town. They they live down the street a few blocks. Bob's had a lot of trouble finding a job because he has a prison record. He has excellent references from the last place he worked, and, but it's been 10 years since he's been in prison, and now he can't seem to find anyone who'll take him on in his time of need with his record. So I thought we could get acquainted with them tonight, and maybe you could put a word in for him down at the plant. I hope it's okay uh, with you that I invited them. I said, eh, sure, sweetheart, it's fine. So Bob and Carol came over for dinner, and I enjoyed the evening. A few days later, at my request, my boss would call the man's former employer, and he was happy with what he heard, and I was pretty stoked when he offered Bob a job. But right now, it's still Saturday night, and it's bedtime, and here another day has passed, another day in which I still haven't lived the kind of Christian life that I'd like to be living. 
Lord, I want so much to serve you, but how can I with all these interruptions? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, my prayer is simply, would you open our eyes to just what you're doing? So often we get, we get focused on, on my plan, my schedule, my way of doing something, my definition of what service or, or whatever else is, and I fail to see that you're working in my life at all times. My world is where I am right now. Those people are the ones that you've brought into my sphere of influence, with, and I have the privilege of impacting them for you. Lord, would you, would you open our eyes to the possibilities around us? And then, Father, open our mouths to be able to share and to say the things you would have us to say to them. And, Lord, if all of that's going to happen, we need to be submitted to the power of your spirit within us. So, Father... I will just say again, I, I admit that so often I, I do things on my own. I have my own ideas. I have my own agenda. Father, I admit that to you. I ask your forgiveness. Would you fill me with your spirit? And I thank you that I know that's a prayer that you answer. And I thank you for the, the empowerment that you give me to be able to carry out what you've called me to do. Otherwise, Lord, it's impossible. I don't enjoy pain. I don't like difficult situations any more than anybody else does. But when I know there's a purpose for it, when I know that you're using me strategically in that difficult situation, it changes everything, and I thank you for that knowledge. Lord, as we give now, would you uh, just use these gifts, these offerings, these funds to spread this message of hope and encouragement to a world that thanks you for Fridays and hates Mondays. Father, may we begin in our own lives and then to those around us to change that attitude and recognize that it's all for you. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here at Crosswinds Church, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over this world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page. Or you could go to cwcmv.org forward slash give. Join us in what God is doing through this vision of growing and going. And have a great day.